been wondering what the apt idiom is to describe this talk, and I think it's fools rush in. So I want to thank everyone for bearing with my foolishness as I try to uh, construct or develop or present a kind of apologetics of cool. Um, Built on the work of Bell Hooks, um, who was writing in 2004, um, this paper considers the strategies of cool that seem to be a response to the epistemic negation of and violence against black men, particularly in this moment that we're in right now. Uh, even now, I think gender studies still demonstrates something of a bias towards womanhood. Um, and although this is changing, I think in this paper, I want to broaden this scholarly focus just a little bit. Um, I think it's important to state the obvious. I'm a white woman writing about black masculinity. So again, I want to apologize for my impertinence. Um, unfortunately, my curiosity as a scholar is not limited to myself or my own subjectivity. Um, and I would like to understand and unpack the way that black men increasingly function as metonymic of political or conscientized cool. Um, and I think cool has recently been tied to anger, especially post George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. And I'm trying to understand cool and anger as someone who is uncool and maybe not angry enough. Uh, the paper has um, three subsections. I just see that, there we go, the slides are working. Um, first, I want to introduce Hooks and Paul Gilroy, who create an argument about jazz musicians as the personification of cool. Um, and second, I want to look at This Is America, the Donald Glover music video as a pessimistic anthem of cool. And third, I want to look at the art of Mahal Modisa King and specifically one series that he does as a form of high culture or what I'm calling highbrow cool. Okay, let me just forward this again. Okay, so first, um, I want to talk a little bit about bell hooks. And I think I should say that this talk is also a talk about media and about mediums and how they convey different messages to misquote McLuhan. Um, but basically, I use the work of bell hooks, who wrote a very good book, which I highly recommend, called We Real Cool, um, and Paul Gilroy, who wrote an equally wonderful book called Darker Than Blue, um, and in both of them independently, and I haven't found any scholars who bring the two arguments together, but they uh, compare uh, rap and hip hop on one on the one hand to blues and jazz on the other hand, and, and arrive at a fairly scathing analysis of hip hop and rap. And there are basically three components to the argument collectively made, but independently made by Hooks and Gilroy. Um, and the first is that they think that blues and jazz um, are a means by which to lament pain and suffering. They are a call to collective mourning. And we might call this argument the death argument, or at least that's what I'm calling it. Gilroy describes the era of jazz and blues as a furtive moment when it was still meaningful to ask the existential question that Ralph Ellison identified as the late motif of Louis Armstrong. The question is, what did I do to be so black and so blue? Hooks quotes Stanley Crouch, who thinks of jazz and blues as having the, quote, affirmative miscegenated heat necessary to melt down the iron suits of history. Thus for Hooks, the cool that was historically tied to black masculine subjectivity was a means by which to remain centered amid suffering and hardship without becoming unfeeling. Um, and I just need to forward there. And I quote her, she says, just as today's gangster rap invites black males to adopt a cool pose, to front and fake it, to mask true feelings, the blues was an invitation to black men to be vulnerable, to express true feelings, to break open their hearts and expose them. 
Black males have helped create the blues more than any other music as a music of resistance to the patriarchal notion that a real man should never express genuine feeling. Do rap and hip hop use cool as a means of distancing men from their feelings? This is the question. Gilroy definitely thinks so. He ties this critique to the violence inherent in these genres of music as opposed to what he perceives as the non-violence of blues and jazz. And he quotes Martin Luther King Jr. who criticized the violence of Franz Fanon's thinking and writing in the 1960s. And I quote, if we want to turn over a new leaf and really set a new man afoot, we must begin to turn mankind away from the long and desolate night of violence. That's Martin Luther King Jr. So for Gilroy and Hooks, black masculine subjectivity is pulled towards vulnerability and sorrow by jazz and pulled towards violent indifference by rap and hip hop. For them, this is the conflict over masculinity, which begins with lament as a nonviolent, a cerebral expression of emotion and ends with something that seems to be more interested in cool, but by virtue of this is less so. The second point, or argument, I guess you could call it, um, is th that both B Hooks and Gilroy think of jazz and blues as anti-capitalist. Uh, this is a kind of mi mildly Marxist argument, but regardless of those who think of rap and hip hop as representing black power, Hooks basically says that it's designed for mass consumption. And she says the chief, chief trait is the embrace of capitalism, quote, the support of patriarchal violence, the conservative approach to gender roles, the call to liberal individualism, which all reflects the ruling values of imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, albeit in blackface. So rap and hip hop, she says, offers little spiritual nourishment um, but this is not just an economic or a social argument. This is also an aesthetic one. And so Gilroy grieves the loss of profundity. He thinks of the experimentation and improvisation in jazz and blues, the poetic depth, the aesthetic complexity, um, the irony and ambiguity in jazz and blues, um, the emotional complexity that is thus reflected in musical complexity. Um, and he says that none of this is present in hip hop and rap. Okay, and then on to the third point, which is really about a protest um, which is offered by jazz and blues. Um, and really here, the point is that both of them think of jazz and blues as emotionally honest and therefore cathartic and that this catharsis leads to a kind of, of healing. Gilroy says that um, it sounded pessimistic, but jazz and blues were rooted in the hope that was radical. Um, for Hooks, any black man who dares to care for his inner life, for his soul, is already refusing to be a victim. Um, Hooks says the hip-hop mantra of keeping it real is a kind of fake cool which has no transformative power, no ability to intervene in a politics of immaturity and domination. She likens this attitude to the immaturity of a white patriarchal masculinity that refuses to change. She says that hip hop and rap reinforce the status quo. They offer no possibilities of redemptive change or healing. They are the ultimate drug that keeps black men addicted to the status quo and in their place. And finally, she describes rap as just a black minstrel show. So I think her point is well made and it's very useful, as is Gilroy's. But I also think there have been more intellectual, more honest, more radical expressions within the broader genre of rap and hip hop. Um, and one example, although there are actually lots of examples, but one example which I'm not going to deal with and, and talk about, but which I'm going to just whet your appetite with, is the Odd Future movement. Um, of which Frank Ocean is a really great example. His music is introspective, it's intellectual, 
Um, it's full of intertextual references. He refers to Radiohead and Stanley Kubrick and, you know, various sort of cool lefty kind of references. Um, he also makes beautiful um, lyrics about women and uses female protagonists, sometimes queer protagonists. Um, so wonderful, wonderful subversive stuff, which I'm not going to deal with, but which I just wanted to mention, because I think there are many counterexamples that push back against um, Gilroy and Hearst. Um, but I'm no musical scholar and I'm woefully out of my depth here, but I do want to look at just one example of a music video um, that I think seems to openly engage the very criticisms launched against rap and offer a response to these that I think feels brutally honest, emotionally raw, and yet profoundly intellectual. And so this is part two of the lecture in which I'm going to deal with Donald Glover. And I'm going to start with a quote by Paperboy, I have to rap, that's what rap is, making the best out of a bad situation. So there are a number of questions that I ask here too, um, and important to say that I'm not just looking at a musical track, but that I'm looking at a music video. Um, and so there is a question about medium, um, a question about whether the medium of rap can be, and music video, can be intellectually subversive, or whether it is always reductive of reality and also how music video complicates meaning, particularly in terms of the spectatorial performance of black male subjectivity. In other words, the first question is whether the medium is indeed always the message. But there's also a second question about tone of voice and about the potential value of violence, particularly when juxtaposed with celebration. Um, can violence express righteous anger, for instance, and then third, there's a question about the morality of masculinity, which masculine subjectivities are right and which masculine subjectivities are wrong. But I'm going to address these three different kinds of questions in an entirely higgledy-piggledy and entangled way since they are largely interrelated. So first, just Donald Glover um, is a graduate of New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. Um, he was recruited by David Miner and Tina Fey as a writer for the critically acclaimed and brilliant and sensitive and, and exceptionally funny NBC sitcom called 30 Rock. If you haven't watched it, get it. It's just amazing. Um, and I think this is important because it demonstrates that his formative tone of voice, the, the tone of voice that he was initially schooled into as an entertainer and artist, was satire. Um, and then in 2016, he created, starred in, and sometimes directed the award-winning Atlanta, which is even more acerbic. It's a series which chronicles the life of an Ivy League dropout trying to reinvent himself as his rapper cousin's agent. Again, a poignant, powerful, um, yeah, laced with the sort of discontent that would find full fruition in This Is America. Um, later, under the name of Childish Gambino, which is a name that he apparently took from the Wu-Tang Clan name generator. Again, I would recommend that you that you find out your own name through this generator, according to which my name is Spokesperson Erratic. Um, but he, under this name, then released a number of mixtapes, independent mixtapes, um, and later three very successful albums, which um, were uh, produced by Glass Note Records from 2011 onwards. This is America was released in May 2018. It had 50 million views on YouTube in three days. Um, it debuted at number one. It won four Grammy Awards in 2019, including Best Video, which was directed by Hiro Murai, um, who's also the uh, director of Atlanta. Anyway, so it's 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 a very illustrious piece of art, and I'd really like to show you a little clip from it. Um, I must give a trigger warning for those of you that haven't seen the video. It contains rather extreme violence. So if you're sensitive to that, just turn away for a little bit and then we'll continue afterwards. Okay, let's see if this works. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah
Um, guys, I'm sorry, I'm getting a message that says my screen is not shared. Have you been seeing my screen? Uh, it's fine on my side, Stella. I, and can you see the video? And I can see and hear, yes. Okay, good. I'm going to carry on then. Sorry about that. <laughs> have got a, a kind of sense of it there, so I'm not going to show too much more. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen it lots and lots and lots of times. Um, so I'm going to start with this quote by Frank Guan, which I think is just really helpful. He says, I'm going to read the whole thing. Sorry, it's quite long. He says, jubilant black culture abounds not only in resistance to the lethal violence directed at its makers, but also in complicity with it, in complicity with it. When Gambino states the murder of a black guitarist and a black church choir, it's not a white policeman pulling the trigger, but Glover himself. And after each kidding, he resumes his dancing with the same live wire energy and his rapping with the same assured flow as if nothing had happened. So I think this is really important. Gambino positions himself at the center of this critique. Um, I think this is, is, is powerful because there's a critical appraisal of a confluence of issues. Um, he's criticizing from his own vantage point the hip hop industry, the pathologizing of black men as violence, police brutality. But as Jennifer Lynn Lemessurier points out, the video begins with a wink. This cheeky, almost flirty gesture reveals the deliberate irony and contradiction which is at the heart of the video. Gambino enacts the contradictory expectations placed on black men by the popular media, where they appear as both hyper-violent and hyper-talented. This is America is particularly significant because Gambino is simultaneously dancing and killing. And through this semiotic contradiction, we see Gambino critique the spectatorial expectation of a constantly moving ever entertaining black masculine subjectivity that can only result in what Le Messurier terms an atmosphere of ontological exhaustion. And I'm going to quote what I think is on her part a very intelligent analysis. She says the overlapping societal, legal and historical norms that were constructed in support of white supremacist structures have produced expectations for black heterosexual masculinity that are full of incoherence. Yet these norms are still leveraged rhetorically as authentic markers of black male embodiment. To remain legible in a system that regularly threatens, maims or kills black bodies, black people must continually move via kinesthetics of entertainment 
that is marked by excessive spectacular skill. I want to turn very quickly to the medium and talk about it as a, as a disruptive form of protest. Um, Ian, Ian Kaplan, writing in the late 1980s, um, spoke about the postmodern music video as a more cerebral music video than the traditional genres like performance or romance music videos, which were the preserve of VH1 in the late 80s and early 90s. The postmodern video, even in the early 90s, allowed for a combination of factors like performance, surrealist collage, video sampling, that served to complicate the narrative of the lyrics rather than merely illustrating them in a rote way. This is America probably fits into this category and therefore is a more anarchic product than the music videos traditionally associated with hip hop and rap, the ones that Hill, Gilroy and Hooks were criticizing. The contradictions in the music video, winking, dancing, shooting, are echoed in the lyrics, which underscore the polemic contradictions imposed on black men. So I'll just read some of these. We want to just party. We just want to, the, we just want to get the money, which is followed by, don't catch you slipping now, police be tripping now. Grandma told me, get your money, black man. So there's a, there's a sort of deliberate juxtaposition of a kind of mock flippancy on the one hand and a real political critique on the other. Uh, get your money, black man. Get your money, black man. And of course, this is followed by the concluding statement, you're just a black man in the world. So there's lots of really kind of contradictory messages here. And the rhetorical platform for disruption and dissonance is provided by the music video which subverts the status quo by showing reality for what it really is. I also want to briefly mention Kapano Ratele, who now is um, in the psychology department here at Stelis, um, and uh, he argues for the Fanonian non-being to be comprehended and to comprehend himself requires affective and political work. Uh, which he says has to happen beyond cognitive labor. And he says that there's a visceral pleasure provided precisely when there is a thematically and musically violent or disruptive event. And I wonder if a better word for this violence isn't possibly anger. Um, Taylor speaks of the pleasure of violence as it's being so disruptive and so shocking that it wakes us up out of the status quo. Um, and I want to think through anger as a means of doing this. Um, Anthony Appiah um, provides a defense of cosmopolitanism. This is, of course, the famous term that he uses. Um, a text, a book um, that is concerned with cultivating what he calls habits of coexistence. And he talks about right and good as thin descriptions. So here, thinking about the morality of, of these terms, um, he says that they're thin because they're general and often uncontroversial. He says thin descriptions are shared across countries and communities. They're universally acceptable, but they're also for that reason quite bland. Um, so he says thin concepts can result in thicker evaluations, like for instance, the concept of rudeness. A uh, rudeness, for instance, um, brings to the fore a host of cultural references all the way from Oscar Wilde to the controversial Louis C.K. Now, anger may seem like a universally understood or thin concept, um, but it could also be expressed in a way that is so specific, so targeted, that it becomes thick. Um, and I think locality is important here. But Appiah also introduces the concept of conversation between peoples and communities. He says that conversation is needed in order to learn from each other. He makes an argument for empathy and mutual understanding, and he thinks of conversation as at the heart of this. So just to take a step back, if lament is the authenticating mark of jazz, the core of its cool, 
then perhaps anger is at the heart of and the kind of music most famously epitomized in This is America, which I'm going to resist categorizing or placing in a genre. Um, and I would argue that this is representative of a kind of thick anger, which ties it to writers like Fanon, who vocalized their anger as specifically race. The point is that this anger is also an attempt at conversation in the Appian sense. It may be aggressive and violent, and it certainly is, but it is also cosmopolitan, meaning that it is seeking to be intelligible to a community beyond those from within which it was made. So Donald Glover becomes the author of a meta-narrative in which black masculine subjectivity is more complex than being the mere object of a racist gaze. Glover, I think, looks through Gambino at the viewer consumer. He asserts his right to look. He looks back. He returns the gaze. And as such, he is both angry and restrained, feeling and thinking, passionate and objectively in control. This is America offers a means of thinking against the historical tropes of gender and racial essentializing often seen in rap. It not only provides a form of lament about the carceral state and racist politics in America, but also seems to make a redemptive argument about the genres of hip hop and rap. So this is an argument about medium. The video concludes with Gambino running from a white mob and the threat of the sunken place. Here his anger has turned to a palpable, desperate fear that seems to indicate the final indictment of this America. Okay, and um, on to the third part of my lecture. I want to show you some of, I'm only going to talk about one series, but I want to show you some of his other work because I think it's quite important to get a sort of overview. Um, so this is Mahal Modisa King. Uh, this is the series that I'm going to talk about. It's called Ditaola. Um, he was born in Soweto in the 80s. He lives and works in Cape Town and sometimes in Joburg as well. Um, notice the way he's holding the dove in this image. Um, this is my, one of my favorites, and I think a, an image that I'm going to talk about a little bit. Here's another one. This is one of his other series, which I'm not going to deal with, Metamorphosis, um, the idea of a man turning to dust and the transformation that happens in the body, um, the disintegration. Um, notice the Trilby hat, same series. Always this kind of esoteric quality to his work. Um, Bainey, uh notice the um, uh, blinkers that he's wearing that prevents him from looking back, only allows him to look forward. Notice the machete, it's violent objects, quite dystopian. Um, and this is a very beautiful three-channel video presentation. Uh, notice the woman with the whip in her hand. There are these significant objects that each person is holding in a little rowing boat. Um, a commentary on um, transoceanic slavery. Um, here is the slave boat. Videos together. Okay, and this is what I'm going to be talking about. So how does Hook's argument about a politics of cool translate into South African terms, where one might also argue that we need men to feel and show empathy in order to bring about real change? If Glover creates a music video that narrativizes anger, then acclaimed South African fine art photographer Mohal Modisa King creates epic temporal tableaus where anger and lament are reconciled. They're completely void of fear. And I wonder if this fearlessness in Modisa King, and of course in someone like Fanon, isn't the reason that his cool, their cool, feels so politically effective. 
Modissa King works mainly in self-portraits, which Ashraf Jamal describes as inescapably a matter of style. For what we are dealing with are theatricalized or performed moments. Each portrait then is a study in self-reflexivity imbued with a sort of existential confidence. This has to do with the way in which Modissa King places himself at the center of his art, but also relates to the almost mystical way that he uses the photographic medium. Jamal following Sontag describes this as an occultation. So there's ambiguity, it feels ethical because it does not prescribe or close meaning. I think this is very important in terms of his art that it's so open-ended and layered. It remains elusive, it cannot be fixed in time. For instance, um, in one of the earlier images in passage, you see that the characters holding a whip infamously used by the apartheid police to control crowds, but also used today by vigilante groups to discipline criminals in, in communities. So although his is a photography operating with a critical awareness of apartheid, it also refuses easy categorization. Mohal Modisa King's self-portraiture is mapping a different path wherein he uses the corporeality and vulnerability of his body to express the untenability of distinctions such as colonial, post-colonial, traditional, modern, male, female, image, reality, human, animal. He troubles these binaries. Instead of falling into the category of post-apartheid artist, which I think is quite often the default position for contemporary artists, Modisa King refuses this status and identifies with the figure of the widow, a far humbler, more transient figure, but also one who mourns the past. In the series Ditaola, he appears shirtless against a bottle green backdrop. He holds a rifle. In one image, he looks over at a white dove perched on the barrel of a gun. In an earlier image, the dove sits quietly. In later images, it flies upward and releases fine white powder as it flaps its wings. Throughout, he wears a Zulu leather skirt, Isidwaba. He explains this is a symbol of matronly status, of the women who are married, of the women who have suffered and are widows. Through an identification with the figure of the widow, Modisa King laments the past by reconciling his masculinity with a seemingly womanly expression of pain that is sobering to behold. Satire and rage are two responses to the persistence of racial prejudice, but sobriety is another. Although she does not use the word, for Ruth Simbao, this is fundamentally an intersectional approach to masculine subjectivity. She explains that black men are often cast as too physical and thus hypermasculine, whereas white men are often represented as having the right balance of mind and body. She describes Modisa King's art as an explicit critique of the stereotyping through representations of subtly becoming masculinities that agilely flow from militant exploits to embodiment of women's widowhood. Modisa King moves beyond stagnated racialized notions of gender, she says. Ashraf Jamal quotes Modisa King as saying that, quote, people seem more committed to keeping things as they are, as, to, uh, as opposed to opening space up to more diverse people with more diverse ideas and influences. The level of complacency has reached the point where it smells immoral. Not unlike Glover, Modisa King interprets himself as artist and man as in tension with a world that is inherently violent. But Modisa King is far less concerned with showing us a world, Africa, as it is typically perceived to be, as a place of unreason, terror, horror, a nightmare from which we cannot awaken. Instead, his signature, his enigmatic and adjectival pull, stems from some infinitely gentle and subtle grasp of what it means to be human in Africa. If we understand the power of the epiphany, he also well knows the inescapability of shadows. 
It is through the balance of political honesty and aesthetic subtlety that Morisa King demonstrates the decolonization of art. And just to return to you know the early points that Gilroy and Hooks makes, I mean, I think in the first place, um, as a first kind of answer, uh, Modisa King definitely provides a lament. I think that's the first response to the, the Hooks argument. The second is that his art is definitely anti-capitalist because it is aesthetically complex and doesn't provide cheap thrills. And the third is that I think it is a form of protest because it counters the stereotype notions we have about masculinity in South Africa as simply this or that. You know, it makes a subtle, sophisticated and complex argument about masculinity, even without wanting to address this directly. Um, and most importantly, I think like Glover, Modisa King and other South African creatives like Cesar and Porfu Walsh um, dissolve uh, what Amir Skriniva's son calls the false dichotomy between reason and anger. Um, in his art, I think we see that you can hold these two together and hold them lightly. Okay, in conclusion, I'm, I'm, I'm just about finished. So Hooks was basically saying that jazz is writerly and that rap is readerly in, in Bud's terms. Um, and I have tried to make the argument that This Is America is a highly writerly text, meaning that the reader must decipher it, must engage, um, must participate in the meaning making, must push through the confusion, that the rage of the artist demands active engagement, that the reader cannot remain passive, that they must co-write alongside Glover, Gambino and Marai. And this is obviously true and evident for art. We accept this argument about art as seen in the work of Modisa King. But my argument is that it is also true for rap. It would probably have made more sense to compare American hip hop to South African hip hop, of which there is a great and rich um, uh, archive, or to Kwaito as integral to the localizing of hip hop as is seen in groundbreaking tracks like Ghetto Scandalous. But I really wanted to point out how anger is manifest across different media, whether readerly or writerly, and that this is tied to a kind of black masculine subjectivity that is cool. Um, because this is an honest expression of pain, it is a form of real cool in Hooks's terms, not fake cool. And it is in the catharsis we experience when we consume the real thing that we find real joy. I have tried to argue that if rational politics has no room for anger, then it has no room for one of the few weapons available to the oppressed. Having said that, <laughs> finally, I turn now to another publication by Hooks, that great stoic of anger. In 2004, in The Will to Change, uh, Hooks, wrote about anger as the only emotion that patriarchy values in men. She said violence is considered a positive expression of patriarchal masculinity, but she also saw violence as a precursor to something beyond. She saw violence or anger as a defensive or reactive strategy that although necessary can lead to something else. She counsels men through her own lament, and I'll end with this quote. She says, it is not enough to stay in the space of reaction. Being simply reactive is always to risk allowing that shadowy past to overtake the present. Beyond reaction, any male, no matter his past or present circumstances, no matter his age or experience, can learn to love. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Stella, for this uh, thought-provoking analysis and 
for really giving us the opportunity to also broaden our minds to some of the concepts that you deal with uh, in the in your uh, presentation. Um, I would like to open up the floor. Um, I will look at the chat if you have any comments or uh, questions um, in the chat, or otherwise you are also welcome to just um, raise your hand or and put on your mic and then uh, and video, and then you can ask a question directly as well. Thank you. Stella, I don't see anything in the chat at the moment. Uh, I don't know if any of the delegates would like to comment or ask a question to Stella. We will make the presentation um, and the recording of the session available to uh, everybody who has attended as well. So I'm sure, Stella, some of some of us would really like to engage with this further and um, have a real look at the video. Um, I've got one comment from Christian Marstorp. He says, I wonder about the multiple meanings of cool. In jazz, there used to be uh, a, mu a musical distinction uh, between hot and cool jazz, where hot jazz was virtuosic and cool jazz was uh, restrained and uh, bebop players were cool in the sense of being fashionably impressive and aloof, but musically they were hot jazzers. Do you have any comment on that, Stella? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm using cool, obviously, in a slightly different way. But I mean, I think it's a really valuable question to ask, in the first place, how do different genres of music respond to this question of cool? But in the second place, I think Hooks is really brave in sort of asking a question about what real cool is, you know, what, and I, I often have this conversation with my students about the word interesting, you know, what does it mean to really say something is interesting? And I think Susan Sontag has a really great essay in which she writes about the interesting as a word that is increasingly used as a substitute for the beautiful. Um, and I think cool is also a word that we use really glibly um, and so cool is often used in the sense of, of, of being um, uh, 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 a, a kind of, a, a kind of, 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 of refusal of emotion. Um, and I think what Hooks is trying to say is that actually masculinity that is really cool is masculinity that is in touch with emotion and is willing to express that. And so whether, you know, hot jazz or not, um, I think that there's there's different genres of jazz, but something that they all have in, in common is that they're simultaneously emotive and cerebral, that there's something very cerebral about jazz. It's often criticized for that, but that at the same time, it's very emotional. It's resonant with the feelings of the musicians. Um, and I think that's what Hooks is really praising and enjoying and appreciating. Uh, thanks, Stella. Um, Sandra, I saw your hand as well. Professor Sandra Swart. It is Sandra Swart. Thanks very much, Stella. That was so interesting in so many different ways. Could you talk more about the funny? Could you talk more about the humor in these people's performance? And also the controversial humor, you know, the bro rape side of Donald Glover. And I'd be interested in that, the way he says that there's nothing that should be taboo. I err on that side myself, as you know. But um, I'm interested to hear your opinion in the broader sense of cool masculinity. Yeah, I mean, I think there is a there's a sort of Dave Chappellean sort of um, way of thinking through humor um, as also an expression of anger. So I think I think that it's something that we need in this current moment because we are policing our words to the extent where it becomes difficult to say something. Um, I think, and that's why I made so many caveats at the beginning of this talk, it's very difficult to, to make any kind of pronouncements these days that are political. Um, and especially, I think it's difficult to make pronouncements um, that are risky um, and that say something that um, is critical of others or is violent or is angry. And I think that, the humor of people like um, Donald Glover 
um, alongside someone like Tina Fey, who I think was initially a person who was kind of schooling him and he was schooling her, you know, working together on something like 30 Rock. Um, and, and, and also comedians like Dave Chappelle, I mean, there are many others, but who, who, who sabotage to some extent, who, who resist and who um, poke fun at the very taboo subjects that we all find so sensitive and so difficult to talk about. Um, and I think their very explosive sense of humor um, allows us to release, it's cathartic, um, and allows us to engage in this way that is a form of conversation to use Anthony Appiah's terminology. And I think it's very important. I think it's healing. Um, Glover is difficult because his work is satirical, um, but also earnest. You know, there's a there's a there's something very earnest about what he's doing, specifically in a series like Atlanta. Um, and even in This Is America, there, there's, I wanted to, you know, talk about that juxtaposition of dancing and winking and shooting and the way these work together to create a quite complex and composite masculinity, which I think is much closer to what we really are as humans than the caricatures which we often create when we are writing about masculinity as scholars. I hope that That's, answers your question. Yeah, it certainly does. I just wanted to add that Please um, do. the person who Donald Glover most forcibly reminds me of at the moment is my great grandmother, who, who would be most surprised at the com comparison. But she lost her kids and she lost her farm in the Anglo-Boer War. But after the war, she was much prone to saying, ah, you know, the British are not a bad people. They just don't know how to run a good concentration camp. Oh, and I wow. think it's a cathartic. It's yeah. certainly a way of healing, but also a way of saying the terrible taboo thing. I wouldn't yeah. link it to masculinity here. And the other thing is, I wouldn't call him earnest. I would call him serious without being earnest. And that's what I like about him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I found I, I found your work on humor and, and the terrible laughter of the Africana very useful. Um, and so I would be curious to to see if you wrote something on uh, the humor of Donald Glover. Like, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um, anyone else? Great. Thanks. There's a, another hand up, Steve. Yeah. Hey, Stella. Thanks for that. Um, it was really informative. And I also want to kind of ask a question similar to a wall. Um, Along the lines of humor as a as a solution to certain things, I like what I enjoyed about it is um, a solution being that men or masculinities need to get in touch with their emotions more, and one of those emotions is definitely anger. And I just want to know if you maybe have um, some kind of suggestion in a way that emotions like anger can be instantiated non-violently, because a lot of the time. Anger comes from being a victim of some kind of violence. And I'm just wondering if we can perform non-violent anger in a way that's not simply submissive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a difficult question for me to answer, but my paper was an attempt to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the corollary, the, the added question is how do we respond to anger? And I mean, actually, this, the seed for this whole talk, the idea for it, came several years ago when Pumla Gaborda Marikizela did a Stellenbosch Forum lecture in the wake of the Fees Must Fall movement. And she spoke about, I hope I'm not misquoting her, but she spoke about um, violence as quite often the result of trauma, that where there is trauma, there will almost necessarily be violence. Um, and some of you will have heard me quote this, but it made a very big impression on me when she asked, what is the response? How do we respond to violence? So we shouldn't necessarily be asking, are there ways to express anger that aren't violent? But we should be asking, because violence is quite often apt and anger is quite often apt. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, who am I to say when it's apt or when it isn't apt? Mm. But to ask how do we respond to that anger, even when it's expressed violently? And I, I don't mean literally, but I mean specifically in art, you know, where you have violence expressed in art, 
how does one respond to that? And I suppose as a corollary, how does one respond to that in real life? And um, uh, Professor Gaboro Marikazela was talking about, for instance, the occupation of the library. And she said, and again, I hope I'm not misquoting her, but she said radical empathy oh. is the response, you know, that that is the most healing. Um, and again, you can ask, what does that look like and what does that mean? Um, but it was very helpful to me. And I have a friend who has a little boy who who was struggling when he was little with anger. He would get a little bit shy, actually. It was an anger born out of shyness. When he would do something wrong and you would reprimand him or so on, he would get angry and he would get shy. And she said to me, I was looking after him the one day, and she said to me, if this happens, you have to hold him very tightly and just love him, <laughs> you know? Just love him into, into relaxing. He will relax after a while, but just love him really hard. <laughs> and I hope that doesn't sound patronizing, but I think that there, that the response of love is an important one um, in healing wounds across our society and has been very helpful to me as a woman when I've struggled with anger and with feelings of violence. Mm. Yeah, also, um, I think humor is a great one as well. I agree. Just to add to what uh, previous person said. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, exactly. Cool.